Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode number 35 of Beyond the Court. I'm here with the great Todd Boss from Pro Racquetball Stats, USAR board member. Todd, what's up, buddy? How you doing, Sudzy? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing doing well, thank you. You know, this is an interesting show. I really appreciate you joining while Ellie is uh, taking his little vacation. Ellie, what's up? If you're out there, I think you are. Um, you know, so tonight, Todd, we're going to have uh, yourself, of course, the pro racquetball stats guy. You know, I love what you do, and, and so many of us love it because every pro sport has it, and you continue to do it. You put those stats out there. Nobody's ever done it. We really appreciate that, but you're also a USAR board member, and, uh, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit at the end and just to kind of talk about, obviously, this recently announced policy, um, and we're also going to have Holly Ray Scott, USA national team member. So that should be fun, Todd. Absolutely. All right. I, I like your background, by the way. I do like the U.S. Open. Yes, as you were saying, let's let's hope that this happens this year. You know, let's hope. Well, that we... time, time, that's that's another conversation. <laughs> you you want to go that route? Which way? I mean, we got so many ways we can go right now. You know, it's it's it's. We'll talk about that after. <laughs> okay. So, all right, everyone. Here's the deal. Tonight we were going to discuss the recently published policy uh, that the USAR introduced. That, that was every intention I had to discuss it. Uh, the LPRT is following the same policy as well. I decided personally, um, and of course, with some family, friends, and loved ones, that now just isn't the time to discuss it on Beyond the Court. We'll keep it a brief discussion. We're not going to get deep into it. You know, that was going to be the meat and potatoes of the show, but instead we're going we're gonna to have a little bit of fun. Yes, I received a bunch of messages, no doubt about it. I had talks with a bunch of loved ones, friends, family, people that matter. And to be quite honest, many of them, many of you wanted me to talk about it. They just wanted to, to see if it was the right time. And um, that's not why I'm changing direction. I'm really, Todd, I'm just calling a timeout. I'm going to call a timeout. I'm going to get back to it. But I, just like I would prepare for a match when I was playing, I want to prepare and I want to educate myself further on the topic. You know, of course, I, we, Todd, you, we all have opinions on this and many topics, but I'm not going to share mine just yet. Can we have opinions? That's, that's the question, right? Of course we can. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. Um, just because a policy is created, Todd, and anyone else out there, you know, does that mean it's right or it's the best policy? Can it be improved? You know, since that policy came out, I've been doing a lot of research and I've been talking to a lot of people. And, you know, a lot of people have even said, if it hasn't impacted you directly or you have no relation to it, you know, could you talk about it? Yeah, I can. So can you. We can all talk about things that we've never maybe been directly impacted with or we might be impacted with. You know, that's our right. How it, how it happens at the end, though, where it ends and where those relationships go. You know, that's the issue today. Someone asked me in a text, Todd, and you know who it was. They asked me, am I only comfortable discussing things I'm already knowledge about? And for any of you that know me, that is not at all true. I actually want to discuss the hard topics. Todd knows this very well, and I'm glad that he's on the show tonight. Todd and I talk you know, offline about a lot of things. We talk about a lot of the issues that we see or I see in racquetball. We share ideas together, you know, and at the end, we're trying to come come together to, to make it better for all of you, you know, not just me, not just Todd, not just USA Racquetball, but just the sport as a whole. You know, here I am in Ecuador and, you know, the sport feels the effects of what happens in the United States also. It, it trickles all over the world. But am I comfortable? Yeah, I'm, I'm confident that I can facilitate any topic, but can we agree to disagree? You know, that's the worst part. Can we even have discussions, then disagree, still be friends? Will you still play racquetball with me? Will you play with your friend, you know, your loved one, if, if, if they don't agree with you, no matter which way you go? You know, racquetball has a lot of issues. Todd Boss knows that. He's a board member of USA Racquetball, and many other people know that, not just USA Racquetball. But we're not here to, to put, you know, a light on it and say everything's great. We just need positivity. No, we don't. We need to face the reality. We need to face the issues. We need to come together. 
We need leadership to step up and go, yeah, this is a problem. That's a problem. And address it because it's not only about the good. If it was, it's like playing a match again, Todd, you know, I reference it all the time. Don't tell me how great you played when you won your match. I want to know what happened when you lost and you got your ass kicked. That's when we improve, not just by, oh, everything's great. We're trying to do this. We're trying to do that. Yay, yay, rah, rah, kumbaya, no. So I'm doing all I can, you know, to keep racquetball front and center, keep it going, keep it engaged, keep it energized, keep you, keep sponsors, keep businesses involved and want to be part of it. You know, seeing other players, Todd, go to other sports, especially some of our pros. And I'm not going to mention the fact I'm not going to say names, but like, it kills me to see Daniel playing pickleball. He's going to be the best in the world there. I already told him, stop talking to me until you're number one in the world in pickleball. <laughs> you know, personally, just so you all know, if you ever want, I can, we can agree to disagree and still be friends. That's me. But I know that's not everybody and that's okay. You know, I'm going to leave this topic right now for the organizations to figure out and to see what they need to do. Hopefully, they do what's best for the sport today and tomorrow and what's best for everybody and the majority in the sport. And, um, you know, I'm sure we can, we can figure something out and, and Todd, you know, I'm going to go to you now. You're a USAR board member. Mm -hmm. And when this policy was announced, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, we're not going to get deep into it. Right. But, you know, first off, tell everybody why this policy came about, how it came about, like out of nowhere. And, um, you know, give us just kind of a, a background on that part of it. Well, so I, I get the sense that from comments that I've read that uh, that this was that some people think that this is a problem that the USAR board um, went searching for a solution for. Well, that, that's not necessarily the case. Um, but quite simply, um, there wasn't a policy in place. And then suddenly there was there have been cases where there have been transgender athletes that have applied to play in sanctioned, uh, in sanctioned uh, USAR sanctioned tournaments. And one of the, one of the jobs, one of the, one of the reasons to be, one of the reasons Etra for an NGB in this country is to provide standardized policies for their sanctioned events. And that's basically exactly what this was. You don't want to be in a situation where you are sanctioning events in Georgia or California and Texas, and there's a different policy being implemented at the local level because you don't have a policy to find. So quite simply, USAR needed to standardize, needed to issue a policy that its sanctioned tournament directors could abide by and provide a standard level of policy application across the board. And that's basically it. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, Todd, I, I always appreciate our talks and, you know, again, we talk offline and you're not ever afraid to talk about the tough stuff, you know, and, and you messaged me also, um, as far as this topic, when I asked you to join me and, and please, you know, can tell everybody what your message was to me. Well, my message to you was, um, so like it or not, you know, this, this particular issue, like, like a lot of political or like a lot of other issues that, you know, our country, you know, you're in Ecuador, but you know, that, that we face in America. Especially it's everywhere. No, it's, it's everywhere, Todd. It's yeah. everywhere. Yeah. You know, and so this is, this is one of those topics that really gets a lot of passion on both sides, you know, sure. on people who support and, you know, and support the inclusion of, and want to apply policies that allow for transgender athletes to compete. You know, they are, they're very passionate about that. Just as on the other side, people that struggle with the issue of transgender athletes and struggle to um, understand, you know, what, what, what happened there or whether or not they deserve to compete or how you have them compete in a fair, in a fair and in, impartial in manner. This issue brings out a lot of passions in people. And so my concern for you was just generally, hey, no matter where you fall on this, you could, you, you, you have to have some opinion at some point that's going to disagree with some of you know some people that you've known for 20 years and you're not going to agree with them on this particular policy no matter where you fit in the spectrum of inclusion versus outright banning you know anywhere in between there's, there's going to be somebody that's just to the right or just to the left of your opinion who now disagrees with you vehemently because of the passion that this issue raises and that was my big concern for broaching this and having a discussion about it 
And again, Todd, I appreciated that. And, and with that, you know, we had a little private discussion and you still were ready to go. You, you know, you didn't run from it. You just wanted to let me know. And I really do appreciate that. And that's kind of what sucks. You know, it's, it's, it's just the world today. You know, if you agree with someone or disagree with someone, you know, that's it. You're an idiot. You're a moron. You're, you know, look at sports. Who's the goat, right? Hey, why can't we, why can't we just have discussions? Why can't we just mm. understand and, and, you know, look into it? And like, so again, I've been doing a lot of research since this came out because I, I think it's important, you know, obviously now it, it, we, we have this policy that's been implemented in racquetball. Like I said, the LPRT is following suit. Uh, they'll be using the same policy. And, you know, I sent you the video and, and one of the, the interesting videos I saw was about Tokyo 2020. And, um, you know, you said it, Todd, I'm glad you said it. You used the word inclusion. And before we take a quick commercial break and we bring in USA team member, Holly Ray Scott, you know, I'm left with a question. Is it possible to have inclusion and fairness? So we're going to leave it at that. And, you know, I hope you all enjoy the show. You know, I hope you're okay with the route we're going. I think you should be. That's the point of it. I think you should share the feed. It's about racquetball. It's not about us. You know, share this. Get racquetball out there. You're watching because you love racquetball. Again, I'll talk about anything you want, but this is called Beyond the Court, and we discuss racquetball, and it's because we want racquetball to be, you know, the important part of your day, an important part of your life and share it get it out there we're going to be right back todd boss with holly ray scott after this quick commercial All right, we're back with Holly Ray Scott, USA team member. Holly, how are you? Pretty good. How are you guys? We're, we're doing well. You know Todd Boss, right? Of course. Everybody, Everybody knows Todd. Is. <laughs> Holly, we've never met, but I, I know you and, uh, and you know me. There you go. <laughs> and, and I mean, we're meeting is, right now. <laughs> hey, Holly, thank you. Thank you for being on tonight. You know, originally you, you were coming on to discuss a topic that you are somebody that will be directly impacted by the policies. And I appreciate it. You know, we spoke already on the phone and we're not going to get into that tonight. We're going to save that for a future time. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's okay for us, for all of us to have an opinion, you know, but what I, what I do like, and what I think is important for everybody to know out there is I know you've been doing a ton of research yourself. I mean, <laughs> the first thing you said was, I am going to educate and research myself on this topic before I come on the show and you were ready to come on running. So I just want to say thank you to that and, and we'll move on from there. So Holly, how are you doing? You know, you got, we're, you're, you're in Washington now, right? Yes. Yes, I okay. am. Sure. And courts, you got courts, everything's going. Uh, yeah. Our courts are open. Uh, I'm a little North of Seattle right now, just cause Seattle's expensive and school's online. So like, why would I be there? <laughs> um, but I heard that, Seattle just opened their court. So I think the whole state's finally up and running. I mean, I know Washington was the very first state to go into quarantine and lock everything down. And we're one of the last to start opening up. Our restaurants finally opened up two weeks ago. So we've, it's been lonely <laughs> and long. <laughs> yeah. Are, are you able to practice now? Are you fully in training mode now? Yes, I, I did take a couple of days off. I just got LASIK, so no more glasses. Um, so tomorrow it's up again, and uh, I'm I'm ready. I've been ready. I've been going for it. I know right when the festival was announced, I wrote in the comments, I'm ready for it now. Do it right now. I'll go. I'll fly out. <laughs> Todd, I'll, but, I'll hand that one off to you, the festival. You're a USAR board member. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. Well, hey, so speaking of the festival, so now uh, on the U.S., for the U.S. women's uh, side, 
I feel like you are part of what I now call a big four, which is going to be you, Erica, Rhonda, and Kalani. Uh, you know, any given Sunday, are any of the four of you able to beat any of the other four? Is it is the is the national team just going to come down to seeding and matchups, or who's hot that day? I mean, I'm coming for blood. <laughs> I, I'm after losing to my girl Kalani that one point a couple years ago, it haunts me in my sleep. And uh, I will, I'll die on the court before I let any of them beat me again. I love Kalani. Good game. But <laughs> Holly, um, let, let me ask you, I mean, you know, I, I know you work with Cliff and happy birthday, Cliff Swain. Cliff <laughs> Swain, cheers to you, buddy. Happy birthday. I love you. Thank you for making me a better racquetball player in person on and off the court. And you're doing that to Holly Ray Scott. You know, Cliff Swain told me, he said, he told Veronica and I a couple of years ago, Holly, he said, she will win a pro stop one day. And <laughs> I mean, he's adamant about that. Todd, Holly is a battler. So Holly, I'm going to ask you this. You have some LPRT events coming up, right? You have the Sweet Caroline mm -hmm. and then you have the Randy Root or is that after nationals? After nationals. I think it's like two weeks after. Yeah. Okay. Are you planning to go to all three events? All of them. Yep. I'm going out. I already marked the days off of work calendar. I'm, I'm going all three. <laughs> all right. So now Todd, I'm going to put you on the spot because I'm going to ask Holly and then you got, you have to respond to her. You know, this is our first time kind of going back and forth, Todd. So okay. Holly, the USAR national festival announcement came out and obviously, you know, you play singles and doubles. What do you, you know, tell everybody, what do you think of it? Because everybody has an opinion. People hate it. They love it. They're in between, blah, blah, blah. What's your opinion? I mean, I'm really excited for it. Obviously, I'm waiting for nationals, ready to prove myself again after the last one. Um, and revenge also, because national doubles is like together. Got second with Lexi. Um, I am a little annoyed, but not, I still excited, more excited than not that I will have to play for six days because it's doubles then singles one match a day dragging it out having to stay there for that long taking that time off of work and I think that's my finals week is the beginning of it so I have to do finals and take off work and it's play racquetball for whole six days it's, it's gonna be a lot kind of drug out but I'm still happy about it <laughs> so it's like Todd. a little love hate <laughs> I mean, would have been. Would you have rather, you know, for example, you know, one of the things that Sudzi and I has talked about is, is instead of because it's national team qualifying events, you know, for the purposes of getting a team that's going to go represent the U.S. at an international event, you know, would you have rather not had that in conjunction with a, a national, you know, a national tournament of the stature that we normally run, you know, which has national elite and A and B and C and 25 A's and, tw and 30s and 40s and 50s, you know, and just say, okay, well, why don't why don't we just send, hey, if you want to try to qualify for the national team, show up in Phoenix on this weekend, and that's the only draw that we're running. You know, would you would you rather have an event like that, or would you rather be doing your qualifying in conjunction with national? I thought the hard one. I thought that would have been a good idea for the juniors before they did that whole video analysis thing. So I would have definitely shown up for that. That would have been a fun experience. Mm -hmm. um, I do like the nationals, though, having all the amateurs there and in the stands and cheering and everything like that that's just like a whole nother feeling that you, you can't forget you love that uh all the fans um i don't know i i would show the vote <laughs> all right i got I a like different that idea, though. i got a different question for you a couple three years back we used to run u.s nationals in conjunction with an lprt and irt pro stop in fullerton and we had these massive draws but the criticism was that for the U.S. team members who were trying to both compete in a pro event and qualify for national at the same time, that was a struggle for them. Would you, would you be in support of, you know, having a combined pro and nationals event, and you as as a qualifying member being forced to play in two top draws? I I don't think that'd be a good idea to bring that back, as <laughs> you're already trying to focus on playing, you know, your teammates, and that's hard enough as it is mentally to like have to get into that. We're not friends once you go through that door, you know, and then having to hang out with them and then hang out with other people and have the other teams watch you. It's, it's, it would be too much. I think <laughs> mentally, physically, it would be exhausting. 
Yeah, Todd, you know, I, I, I agree with Holly. I think that, but we talked about this and Holly, what my idea was, you know, obviously we're going through this pandemic or whatever, and hopefully it's over. I don't mean whatever, no disrespect. See, Todd, somebody <laughs> just got mad at me for saying whatever. I didn't mean it like that. Um, you know, what my idea was, Holly, first off in racquetball, no offense. Now I'm going to offend us. We shouldn't be catering to us, the elite level, the professionals and the, you know, the U S team, the best of the best, right? Like we're going to be there. We're going to compete. We want to go be on the team. We want to win a U.S. open. You know, I'm more concerned with the amateurs. What my idea was, Holly was, I said, we have plenty of time. Let's go to a location, uh, whatever, Florida, Texas, wherever we can play, hold our qualifier, just mm -hmm. the singles, just, it would just be us. They can stream it like crazy. You know, if it was a spot where, where maybe we can have fans or people get involved, great. If not, you can run it separate. Then you can highlight the national team at the main national event where, hey, maybe we come in, you know, and we do a clinic for everybody, a Q&A. Maybe there's daily interaction with us versus just Holly Ray's on the court. She plays and now she leaves. You know, maybe mm. there's a different feel. So that's kind of what Todd was saying, where mm -hmm. I had said, you know, I don't have a vote. I'm not part of USA Racquetball, but it was just a suggestion I made, which was, you know, guys, we have places we can do this. Like, let's just get whoever wants to qualify or try to qualify. It's a, it doesn't have to just be you and I or, or Rocky <laughs> and Alex and, you know, anybody in the country that wants to try to qualify for the team comes to the team qualifier and then we go from there, but you know, we have it like that. And, and St. Louis, right. I think the singles are the third through the sixth and then the sixth through the ninth. So as a player, I have a question for you, which would you rather compete in first, the singles or the doubles? Singles for sure. Okay. Cause that's the one I really care about is singles. Cause um, I do love doubles, but I, I am a fan of singles more. Mm -hmm. um, and that would, I feel like that would just get me pumped into mm -hmm. doubles. I feel. <laughs> I, got a, I got a question for you, Holly. Would you have rather they have run singles and doubles concurrently over that one weekend instead of making you stay, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? I think at least the qualifiers. But again, like Susie said, we can't cater to us. Um, it would have been nice because I feel like the amateurs, they really have, most of them have no choice monetarily and time-wise and work and everything um, to go to both. Or if they had a kid, all three, like that's crazy. But we kind of, I don't know, it's hard. I, like, I would like to have it just in one. <laughs> you know, like if this was not a, if this wasn't a COVID year, you'd be flying to one city in February to play doubles. You'd be flying to a second city in May to play singles. And you'd be flying to a third city in June to play juniors. So is that better to, to, get, to force you to make three? Holly's not a junior anymore. I'm old now. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's part of this conversation. That's part of the criticism. There, you, and you know this, Sudzy. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of criticism out there about people who do want to stay for all three, right? You know, is it better to have said, okay, well, I can, I can stick in St. Louis and, and get one flight versus making three flights to three different cities in three different times of the year? It's hard to get that many days off work for a lot of people. <laughs> um, but also, like, the juniors, it's, the 18 year olds that are trying to qualify or start getting their bearings of the adult team, it helps them get in the mental, all right, we're going to adults. Okay, two months, I'm going to juniors. I'm using my experience from the adults to go to the juniors and, or the other way around, you know? So mm -hmm. I feel like it helps them <laughs> as well, traveling and separating the two instead of going, okay, I'm going to St. Louis for all three. <laughs> like we talked to Annie and Aaron and they said they probably won't do it because it's just too much yeah. you know and, and and holly right there you know you just hit it like that's what bugs me somebody that came up played all the junior nationals you know then went right to playing for the national team and then play, you know playing professionally and todd that's really what got me holly let me ask you you're not you're a national champ you know you're you're a champion i want to know if you were in the juniors because what you're only a few years removed what would you do this week and and you know, do you think you'd play all three? Oh, she's changing Last her second. headphones. That's better. <laughs> yep, that's great. It's really quiet. <laughs> no, that's good. Do My you, sound like cut out. You could change it. It's okay. Go ahead. We're not, we're not, you know, formal here. Do what you got to do. Uh -oh. Um, so. Uh-oh. Hold on. Wait. <laughs> well, we oh, can we hear you. <laughs> Much clearer now, actually. Oh, yeah. Shoot. Did we lose you, Holly? No sound? 
go. Okay. It was like my computer went weird. Okay. <laughs> All right. You, can you hear us? Yeah, now I can. Yeah. Okay. So Holly, you're, you're not too many years removed, you know, from juniors. And I, I told you earlier, you're one of, just like Todd said, you know, you're one of, if not the best USA female player right now in the country. And would you have played junior singles and doubles if you, you know, were still in juniors? You just said it. Our, our, probably our best junior is not, correct? She's not? Yeah, no, I don't. She said no in the, the, the other one, <laughs> the last time you guys talked to her. So I assume that answer is still no. But uh, we're different people, and I think I, I would have done all three for okay. sure. Yes. Are you playing in the Colorado event in the gym high, the world's singles and mixed? Yes. You are yes. cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. I'll be going to that as well. Who's your, who's your mixed partner? Um, <laughs> I think I have an idea, but I don't want to like just assume. <laughs> so uh, who, who's your, who's your female partner? I don't think there's, there's not. No, no it's, 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 it's LPRT singles, IRT singles, and mixed pro doubles. Oh. And Todd, Todd, it's funny. Nobody wants to say who their mixed partner is. You know, I have mine and uh, <laughs> it's, it's a little. Are you married to your mixed partner? I am not. I, I do <laughs> wish, I do wish she was going. And uh, when this individual called me about a month ago, I said, sure, it'd be a pleasure. Yeah. Hmm. let's let's take a run at it hmm. so you know i i'm i have every intention of being out there at that event holly that's going to be an awesome event so mm -hmm. all right now tell us what are your goals this year what are your goals in racquetball oh racquetball let's get to the top baby <laughs> do as best as i can i mean i'm training and then i think every time i get on the court at a tournament i do better. I mean, over the last tournament in Kansas, I feel confident and uh, I'm really excited for these next pro stops and I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's just racquetball though. <laughs> Todd, do you, do you have Tolly st stats? I do. Oh, don't pull them up. No. <laughs> I'm looking at, well, I'm looking at your match history to kind of see the progression of, of, of the matches that you, you know, that you, the, of the wins that you have. And, you know, so for me, and so for those of you who don't know, in December in Kansas City, you took out Samantha Salas in the, in the, uh, in the 16, which I think has got to be, I think that's your best pro win. Um, I think so too. <laughs> um, you know, but then you turned around and, and you lost in a tiebreaker to, to, uh, to Gabby Martinez, which is, which is no, there's no, you know, there's no shame in that. You know, she's one of the top four or five women in the world, irrespective of her current pro ranking, you know, so. But for, for someone like you, I feel like, you know, where your particular seating, seat, you know, kind of puts you in because, you know, you're not, you, you haven't been touring so much so that you can have a nice, a nice safe top eight seed, you know, so you can kind of know who your matchups are week in and week out, you know, so you're kind of, and I don't know off the top of my head where you're ranked right now, um, you know, but, or where that, where that would set you in, but I will say this because of the COVID canceling a year's worth of tournaments, the seedings on the LPRT are, are just wacky right now. Mm -hmm. And so you don't, you never know who you're going to play. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't really think about who I'm going to play until like I see the draw. So, <laughs> and then I just one at a time, but um, yeah, the rankings are weird. I don't know. I think I'm like 18 now or 19 or something. Um, I, it's well, been hard that's right where you want to be. You play right into the one or two. Holly, what do you got in your lap there? Who is that? It's my rat dog, Freddy. <laughs> Freddy? Yeah, like Freddy's Freddie Mercury. Freddy's pretty cute. All right, Very I like cool. Freddy. Freddy, what's up, buddy? I like Freddy. <laughs> All so, right. So, oh, well, hey. Go ahead, Todd. So, go ahead. So right now, Holly, you're 18. So assuming okay. everyone shows up, you would play Adriana Rivera's in a round of 32 match to then feed into the number two seed, who right now is course maria vargas mm -hmm. so what do you think of that as a as a if everyone shows up and there's no absences in the top 20 well i'm pretty sure she's like what not eight months pregnant right now oh you're right <laughs> so she's for sure not showing up i think Just todd like, get but... with it yeah vargas <laughs> will not be there that's confirmed <laughs> <laughs> hey janelle tissinger showed up at vegas seven months pregnant and won the freaking doubles title with with payola so yeah that's 
So you, I, I will never th- put anything past any any female pro. That's pretty <laughs> incredible. That that is for sure. All right, Holly. So a couple questions for you. Um, obviously, your doubles partner is Lexi, correct? No. I don't know. <laughs> okay. There so also who, might be something else in the works in women's too. We don't know yet. So. On the pro tour or on, on the U.S. team stuff? I'm talking. So U.S. Oh. team first. Oh. Really? <laughs> Okay. And you don't want to talk you don't want to talk about that right now? I don't know if I can yet. I have to wait and find out, but Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's take this a different route. If you could pick your mixed pro partner in Colorado, hand oh, pick I, anyone. Who would you want to play? Anyone? With? Anyone. It'd have to be my boy, my coach, Lalo Portillo. <laughs> wow. All right. Yeah. Okay. Did you say coach? Yeah, he's a coach now, basically. He only through like uh, tournaments. He's on the phone every second, texting, watching. Todd, is, he, is he old enough to be a coach? <laughs> is he younger than you? He's uh, a year younger than me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, That's great. Got a higher ranking than me. He's pretty good. So <laughs> we're like there, besties. There, there's definitely different methods nowadays. It's, it's a <laughs> lot different. Go ahead, Todd. I know you had something there. Oh no, he's well, he's born in '99, um, so I think. But uh, so from a mixed partner, all right. So I think the personally, I think the best mixed doubles team in the world is the De La Rosas, right? Keep they won, they did a sweep in Vegas, they won outdoor nationals, they won Denver last year. You know, who can who? But 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 every time that Mercado and Rivera play, who neither of whom are, you know you know, top four touring pros. But when they get together, they are a really tough doubles team. To, um, you know, is that something that the players talk about? Or is or is the fact that you play mixed doubles so infrequent that you don't think about mixed doubles partnerships that much? I mean, it's, it is pretty infrequent. Like we, I think a lot of people just kind of show up <laughs> and go, all right, we're playing mixed. And then right before the game, here's our game plan. Just because most people don't play either mixed or play with their mixed partner mm-hmm. nearly as often. Like the last mixed pro stop was in what, New York, I think mm-hmm. like three, three years ago. And it kind of was the same. People were just like, okay, we're paired up. Let's go. And it ended up being really fun. I really enjoyed it, but. How, how do you like it, Holly? Would you, if it was available, would you look to play it more the mixed pro? Oh, for sure. It was really fun. Yeah. I, it's a lot like a change of pace with a dude on the court with you, like a IRT guy and then another strong LPRT lady. It's it's pretty fun. <laughs> it gets intense. <laughs> do you pref- do you prefer singles or doubles? Singles. I think. I think. <laughs> Just because it's like all me, you know. And mm. it's, it's well, you little- know, <laughs> well, you know, well, Holly, one one of the things that maybe some fans don't know about you is that you have had a ton of of success on the outdoor circuit as well and an outdoor not only is doubles considered you know doubles gets a lot more priority than singles i would say but you end up playing a lot of doubles on outdoor and especially in the mix so you're you're already playing more mixed doubles than the average than the average person out there and if you count once a year <laughs> in yeah. the beach bash i guess um but that's one wall too which is like crazy different um but yeah, I, I guess technically, but <laughs> I don't know if I count it as much compared to indoor versus one wall outdoor. So yeah. How are you, are you, you're in school full time? Yeah, I'm on spring break right now. I have one more quarter left for undergrad and um, I will be applying to grad schools in the next couple months, maybe mm-hmm. out of state, maybe Texas. <laughs> so... so- you're in school full time. You mentioned you have a job. Where's that job? Oh, I work at a golf course for the summer. <laughs> oh, awesome. Do you, do you golf too? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, see Todd, that's what I really want to do. You know, Daniel and Charlie and I have talked about this. We want to, and Tony Carson too. We want to do like a mixed event where we do racquetball, a little golf, a little oh. tennis, a little outdoor and, uh, Call up uh, in uh, P- Travis Aldinger in Pennsylvania. Does something yep. exactly like that every year. It's golf, okay. racquetball, and something else. I, he does like a there's a third thing, and I don't know exactly what he does. Holly, what's your handicap? That's pretty cool. I didn't know that. Oh, like, do you, 
Okay. But, I have no idea. <laughs> but you can play. You can yeah. smack it. All right. Putting is the weakness. <laughs> well, <laughs> racquetball is very, you know, you got to get the, it's all about a hundred in, trust me. I'm, uh, yeah. I know all about it. I'm down to a five right now. So we'll, we'll have to yeah. smack it around one day. So, sure. all right, Holly, so you, you have a job, you're in school and you're training to be a full-time professional and, and U.S. team member, you know, yeah. <laughs> what's that like for you juggling that? And, and do you have sponsor support? Are there people or companies out there that are helping you call it what it is financially? I mean, reaching your dream, of course, shout out to Mike, uh, helps all the pros with the hotel, which is like a huge chunk of traveling expense. I have Sonny Mauricio. I think he's watching. He just, he helps me out a lot. He's from Bellingham um and gearbox through the contracts everything um but it's it's tough to find people to sponsor especially if you're a girl which is hard <laughs> so it's tough how would you so if somebody wants to help you out or, or sponsor you or be part of team holly you know what's the what's the best way to get a hold of you instagram i try to put it in my little handle but it cut off <laughs> okay. um yeah, message me through Instagram, ask people, do you have this person, if you have Holly's number, just like text me, call me, uh, Facebook, like, let me know, I'm here, I'll support you, I'll fly out, leave lessons, I'll do clinics, I'll, you know, help your business, I don't know, I'll do anything, <laughs> I guess. Todd, Todd, with all the smiles and laughing Holly does, have you, have you seen how vicious she can be on the court? <laughs> Well, I mean, she, I, you know, she alluded to it before when she gets on the court, you know, she's, she's your, she's your enemy. She's, she's playing to win, you know, get off the court and your, your team members, your teammates again. So, Thanks, yeah. <laughs> well, Holly, Todd and I and Scotty Mack are going to let you go. You know, we know uh, you're obviously super busy, you, you school, work, training, and, uh, you know, we'll get, we'll bring you back on another time, you know, maybe when Ellie's, Ellie's back from his little vacation and, uh, you know, we'll see what's going on. But other than that, good luck in Carolina, good luck in Colorado, good luck, uh, in St. Louis. And of course, everything after that, but we, we appreciate you coming on tonight, Holly. Sweet. Thank you for having me. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. We'll see you later. Bye. <laughs> Todd, she's, I mean, she's juggling a lot, you know, and uh, Absolutely. Holly's, Holly's working hard and, and, you know, there's a lot of cases like that out there. And, and that's why it's so important that, you know, USAR and LPRT and IRT and all these organizations get it right. Um, there's mm -hmm. not many of us that, that can do what we do on our own without the help and support of mm -hmm. those organizations. There's very few of us, less than one hand. And, uh, you know, we, we want to help people like Holly and, and many players that are, that are trying to make a living from playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's taking a, t a pretty typical path, you know, where she's playing while she's going to school. She mentions she's going to go to grad school. You know, when she finishes grad school, she's going to be 24, 25, uh, depending on what, uh, you know, depending on what degree she, she pursues. And then she's going to face the same question that a lot of pros face. You know, I think about, you know, guys like, uh, you know, Mitch Williams or Jack Huzek you know, who basically did that same path. They played while they were going and finishing up school. And then suddenly they're in their upper twenties and they're like, okay, I now have an MBA or I have a grad degree in my field and I can get a job paying X. And that X is usually a multiple of what I'm earning on the pro tour of Y. And so suddenly poof, they're gone. Um, yeah. And it's, it sucks losing those players. You know, and that's, that's, a, that's what you, that's what you don't want to see. You know, we don't see, we, th and this seems to be uniquely an American problem because a lot of the foreign athletes do get support from their federations. Correct. Uh, you know, if they're on the, if not every country is the same, and this is a generalization, but this really helps players in other countries stay focused, stay, you know, they, they don't have to go and make a choice. They, they can at least get a stipend or some type of, you know, salary structure that allows them to continue to train full time and can continue to compete oftentimes for, for a decade, if they're good enough. Yeah. We, we talk about that a lot. Obviously here I am in Ecuador and, and my wife, Veronica is the most decorated player in the history, but you know, since she's 10 years old, 10 years old, she has received some sort of financial support 
from the government, allowing her to just focus on being the best possible racquetball player she can be and getting those medals. And, you know, it, it, she's not doing it now. Obviously she's a mom and she actually likes tennis. She's playing a lot of tennis, tennis, competitive tennis, and she's amazing at that too. It's unbelievable. But, um, you know, yeah, that, that's a big hurdle and obstacle we have that is frequently talked about, but the international support, again, money support, they give these athletes and coaches, by the way, you know, I came down here as the head coach because of the opportunity that, that the country offered me. And it just doesn't exist anywhere else. I would love to coach team USA, but they just couldn't afford it or, or maybe they can, but they don't want to pay it. You know, that that's another discussion. You know, where do we allocate funds, right? Where should they go? Should we go to developing a team which develops juniors and develops players because we're getting our asses kicked all over the place, you know, and, it's not a great pattern. Mm -mm. No, I agree. Um, you know, and some, and, and it should be noted that some countries are better at this than others. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of country switching in the last couple of years in particular. Uh, people leaving, you know, oft oftentimes it's Bolivians that are moving to Argentina or, you know, or, uh, you know, there was a, there was a Mexican player who moved to, to represent Colombia recently. Also Mexican that were, went to represent USA. That's true. That, that is true. I'm so glad he did that. Even though I, I'm not a big fan of the, you can just go play for other countries, by the way, just throwing that out there. Well, you know what? You want to have a, dis, a, a debate and a discussion. This is actually a pretty interesting topic, okay? Because dual citizens exist, right? Sure. And, there's, and this, this, this topic comes up with other sports, much more famous and larger than racquetball, all the time. Um, I just read something about, uh, about how a player uh, just committed to the U.S. soccer national team. Right. And this player apparently could have chosen three different countries, you know, because you can go through your father's side and his heritage and your mother's side and her heritage. But then based on where you grew up, you know, and so and so sometimes these players will pay for one country as a junior and then they'll do a one time switch on the national team and they can get a waiver. Well, so consider So turning this back and, and putting it, say, to someone like like Alejandro Landa, hey, he's got he's a dual citizen. Right. I've got no problem doing what he did, you know. Right. It's not like he, you know, some kind of sandbagger who moved across the border so that he could suddenly become a U.S. citizen and compete for the U.S. national team. He's a citizen. Sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, from just from my experience, though, the what we go through to gain U.S. citizenship seems to be slightly different and more difficult than other countries. And again, I don't know because I don't have dual citizenship right now. My kids do. Uh, Veronica doesn't. But, you know, there, it's, it's a process to get that, that citizenship. There's, there's no doubt about it. And I, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. If you could hear, I do have a pretty wicked, it, it's allergy season. Uh, I do not have COVID. I took a COVID test yesterday, and I only took it because I'm traveling tomorrow. Speaking of, I'm uh, going to work with some clients in the States, get those people better, maximize their abilities. Todd, I'm still waiting for you to call me to work on your backhand. Oh, oh. what's going on? In my youth, Sudzy, <laughs> I needed I needed you in 1998, not in 2021. Oh, just just a decision. That's all. It is. <laughs> you know. So, Todd, we're we're gonna end episode 35 tonight. Uh, we're gonna say, you know, I I, I think we kind of covered it. We we definitely didn't want to get deep into it. And, and if mm -hmm. you want to know what we're talking about, just go watch the beginning of the show. And if you lose interest right there, maybe that's part of the issue. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm just calling the time out. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the policy. We touched on it. It's okay to have opinions. It's good to discuss things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I certainly have an opinion. I've done a ton of research, go do some research and then talk about it. You know, uh, this, this, these allergies are killing me right now. Sorry, everybody. Uh, but Todd, before I let you go, there's yeah. nobody better in the history of the sport than stats. So I want to know, I want to know about your opinion, just yes or no. Don't give me a dance around answer. If the people I say you believe deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. Okay. Time out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack a little bit. I'm a big proponent. I think there should be a professional Hall of Fame. Do you agree? So I've been thinking about this and <laughs> the problem... Uh, I thought about whether or not there should be a pro a, a pro hall of fame um, 
because right now the there is a USA R Hall of Fame, which is, with the exception of one person, entirely populated with Americans, right? Uh, that one exception is Heather McKay. Well, that's USA Hall, Hall of Fame, USA right. Racquetball Hall of Fame. Right, but but they have they have pros, and so if you go and you look and you filter based on the pros, it's essentially like a who's who of the top pros that have played, you know, since the early '70s till till now. Okay. Um, Racquetball Canada has their Hall of Fame. IRF has their Hall of Fame. I presume FMR has their own Hall of Fame, although I've, I've never seen any documentation of it. So, um, if we were to do, if we were to create a pro Hall of Fame, oh, and I should also note that the LPRT has their own Hall of Fame. There's a wall in the club that hosts uh, the Sweet Caroline that is literally the LPRT Hall, Hall of Fame. Great. So I do worry a little bit about you know duplicating effort here. Um, but that being said, with the, the way that our sport is going, you know, over the next 10 to 20 years, how many, you know, how relevant is the USAR Hall of Fame going to be? Are they going to have to position themselves and basically claim that they are also the pro Hall of Fame? Because what's going to start happening is once we clear, you know, the, the retiring, the older retiring American pros right now talking, you know, rock, basically Rocky and Ronda, um, the rest of the the rest of the dominant players are all not Americans, and so at that point, does the USAR start admitting you know more non-Americans? You know, like when Alvaro Beltran retires, he's a Hall of Famer. Is he going to go into the USAR Hall of Fame? Well, well, there's three <laughs> ways to get into the USAR Hall of Fame. It's your professional resume, your amateur resume, or as a contributor. But I mean, I don't have a problem with it being filled with USA players. That's part of why I think it's a no brainer, just like any other pro sport in the world. And we should have a professional hall of fame. Yeah. We have, we seem to have the same problem that, that basketball has, you know, there's not a pro basketball hall of fame. There's just the Naismith basketball hall of fame and it gets college players and pro players. And there's this whole mix of, you know, if you go in there and you're only a fan of the pro game or you're only a fan of the college game, you don't know who half the people are in there, you know? So in that respect, you know, there is an argument to be made for, you know, for talking specifically about pro players. Well, because of the way you put it, I am officially nominating you president of the new Professional Hall of Fame. But before we do that, and before I actually nominate you, I'm just going to say a few names. Yes or no, Hall of Famer. Okay? Okay. Drew Katchnik. I Absolutely. Yeah, you know, there's a finite number of people that have won a pro a pro tour and he's one of them tim doyle tim doyle um top 20 top he's if you didn't know he's top 20 in terms of tournament wins and if you were to say to me who's a hall of famer i don't you know out of the thousands of people that have played and he's he's number 18 in, in career tournament wins yeah i think he's a hall of famer tim sweeney sweeney so Sweeney is an interesting one because I think anyone who played against Sweeney, yourself included, probably would have predicted if he had played the Pro Tour that he would have, if not won a, a year-end title, but really, you know, really been competing for it. You know, only guy that ever won four intercollegiates. I don't know if anybody, if people knew that. Um, he single-handedly cost Cliff a title one year. You know, not, 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 not I, I'm not going to. You you earned it. I'm not going to say it that. No, way. no, I know. I know what you. He beat him in the 16s in Chicago. Beat him in the 32s in Chicago. 32s, right? That's how big the draws were, guys. We used to start in the 64s. Beats him in the 32s in Chicago when he's the number one seed, and that and, and he ends up losing the year in title to you by 10 points. You know that was so that that had a huge part of it. Uh, you know, so he he was he was legit. I think you. I think yeah. Well, okay. You know what? You're a baseball fan, right? Yes. So we, we, argue, we argue in baseball all, all the time about big hall or little hall, right? I'm a big hall guy. So I may be boring and just say yes to every one of your, every one of your suggestions. Oh, no. See, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I think you got to earn it. Um, no doubt about it. And I think that, you know, if I was starting a professional hall of fame, I'm not kidding. I, I, I don't know if I should say this. I would start it with probably four people and just inaugurate it like that. Um, no, I'm sorry, more than that. But, but on the men's side, you know, Cliff Kane, Marty, and maybe myself and, and just, you know, open it up and say, Hey, here's our hall of fame. And then you go to the women and you got 
Gould and Paola and, and boom, now you have a pro hall of fame and you can recognize all of those, you know, all those players that are international, but I'm not going to get too far off base yet because I have an important one. I want to ask you too now. Okay. John Ellis. Oh, John Ellis, a hundred percent. Um, 13. I agree. 13th in pro tour win 16th in career win loss percentage. Yeah. I'm looking at my notes. I've, I've looked this up before. Of course you are, you know, but you know, but, but, and he won those events and he lived in a time where the tour also included Cliff, Sudsy, Andy, you know, and uh, uh, it was the tail end of Ruben's career. It was, a, it was basically the tail end of Yellen and, and, and Hogan's career. Those early nineties draws were ridiculous. Rocky and Alvy were there. See, people don't realize Rocky and Alvy were there too. They were, you know, yeah. Rocky and Alvy are four years younger than me or three years younger than me. Uh, Kane just came up, you know, he was, he was not Kane yet, but he was, cause we noticed right away. Um, yeah. You know, Ellie, Ellie to me is a no brainer. I say this all the time, Todd, mm -hmm. and, and this definitely, I say Ellie's top five players of all time. He's uh, you know, he's, he's amazing. And it's, it's such a shame that, uh, that he's, that, that he can barely swing a racket now because of what he did with his shoulder. But, uh, I can turn, I'll turn this around. I'll ask you a couple. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Uh, we'll take a guess. Um, take a guess. Wait, who, yeah. Can we preface it with I don't? I think the hall should be much smaller. You think this the hall is should be smaller? I think that you know if you get in there, it's the pinnacle. It's the, you know, you have to have made an impact in in so many ways. Okay. Like I almost want your name synonymous with the sport. So go ahead. Well. The reason that this that this particular topic comes up is because we just had a hall induction, right? Sure. And if you didn't know, there were you know we inducted two players. You know, one was Amy Rees, who's the most decorated amateur doubles player in the history of the sport. Um, uh, well, with with the exception of one guy who I'm going to ask you about in a second, <laughs> and then a contributor in Kelly Bean, who's done a ton for the sport. We left off a couple of people, but we're talking about pro players. So in particular, we a, per, a player who didn't make the cut this year was Marcy Drexler. Okay, I don't know. I don't know enough about her and her career. Number twelve all time in pro tour wins. Okay, um, she finished. She basically spent a decade ranked in the top three on the pro tour. Okay, um, she her her career started at the with with Lynn Adams' sphere of dominance and ended with Michelle Gould's sphere of dominance. So and she was right in the mix, yeah. And yet she still managed to win like eight or nine pro tours. Uh, yeah, pro that's tour impressive. That, you know, great. Uh, she's in the top 10 career-wise in one loss percentage. She won a ton of events. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 a pretty solid Hall, you know, hall of Fame. Well, um, again, if, if we had a pro Hall of Fame, sounds yeah. to me like she'd be inducted into that. Yeah. Okay, here's another, here's another name for you. Or, or do you want to ask me a name? No, go ahead. But I prefer you to ask me players that I have played against or, okay. or, okay. Javier Moreno. IRF. Yes. Uh, into IRF. Yes. Yeah. But, but no USA racquetball. No USA racquetball hall of fame. No. Yeah. So, I mean, like from a pro perspective, you know, he, from a pro perspective, I feel like he had a career kind of like Mike Guidry's in some respect. Mike Guidry. <laughs> you know? So Mike, Mike Guidry is another great example. You know, another guy who, who was consistently in the top six or seven for this entire range, you know, Cliff Sudsy, Ellis Roberts, um, Ray Doyle, Guidry, yeah. Doyle, all these guys are on the top eight and they, and they toured together for, for 10 years and it took Guidry forever to get through and eventually get his, get his eventual tour win. Jay, we well, forgot, you forgot Jason. Sorry about that. Oh, that's Menino. true. Yeah. Bam and yeah. Menino. Who is also in my top five of all time? I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, you know the the probably the most glaring uh, omission or uh, who's not in the Hall of Fame right now is Jack Husek. He's a Hall of Famer for sure. I mean, he yeah, can, no brainer Hall of Famer. He As can go. He can go in amateur or pro, just like Ellie can go in pro, amateur, and contributor. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that Jack can. Rocky can do amateur or pro when it's his time. 
Yeah. yeah. So, you know, again, it depends. It just, it just depends, Todd. So, you know, we, we will come back to this at some point. I know Ellie loves these chats with you. <laughs> so we'll definitely have, uh, you know, some good ones, but Todd, I just want to say again, thank you really for joining me tonight. You know, it was a, it, it was a conversation. We weren't sure where it was going to go. And, and we spoke about it real quick before. I appreciate you never running from real issues. And, you know, you're somebody at USA racquetball that I believe can and will make a change. Um, I do believe that I believe, but I don't know if you can, you can do it alone, but you have a lot of support. There's a lot of people out there that are backing you, uh, players, fans, uh, personalities, influencers, Mm -hmm. you know, so don't be afraid to go in there and flip the proverbial table upside down. If you think that's what needs to be done. Look, any of us who care about the sport, we all recognize that, you know, that there's things that need that we need, we need to, we need to get from point A to point B to point C. Um, you know, but we all disagree necessarily on, on the pathway there and, and, and how to get it done, you know, or who should be responsible for getting it done. And these are, these are not bad discussions to have. These are, these are, these are healthy discussions to, to, to try to, you know, we, we talk about them and I work in it. We talk a lot about disruptors in the it industry, you know, um, you know, think about just what Uber did to the taxi industry. They disrupted it. They, they ended it by coming to it with a new and a different mindset. And suddenly, you know, 10 years go by and, you know, the taxi industry is completely different than it was 10 years ago. You know, maybe, maybe our sport needs a disruptive force of some capacity or another. I, I don't know what that is. Uh, if I knew what that is, I'd, I'd invest in the stock market and I'd, I'd, I'd be, and I'd be wealthy. Well, I won't go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Todd, again, thank you so much. Scotty Mac, thank you as always. Veronica, my love, thank you for all you do for the show. And of course, players, fans, supporters, everybody out there, you know, I'm doing what I do for you, Uh, your messages, your comments, it's all about you. And I appreciate that. And I'm going to keep going just like you will. And uh, don't forget, you know, we are racquetball and we'll do what we can. Don't give up. Let's keep going. Uh, Todd Boss will help him out. And we will see you next week, Sunday night, episode 36. I'll be coming at you from, not Ecuador. It'll be somewhere in the United States. New York you, City. Maybe, maybe so. But there will be some cool content too. Watch next week. I'll be in different places doing some cool racquetball stuff. So uh, take a look at that. And uh, if you want to know who my mixed pro partner is for Denver, message me. Maybe you could sponsor me and I'll tell you. <laughs> you get in on that. Todd, don't go anywhere. See you guys later. Have a great night. Thank you again.